Our story starts in the Solent, the body of water dividing the diamond-shaped Isle of Wight from the coast of southern England. The town of Cowes plays host to the longest running annual regatta in the world, and every alternate year, this being one, the event culminates with the start of the 600-mile fastnet race. Two days after the last boats disappeared below the horizon, Venture 2 followed in their wake down an English channel living up to its nasty reputation. We spent the first night in the new marina in Portland which will be the site for the Sailing Olympics in 2012. The next day, in much improved weather, we headed out past the Breakwater Fort, which took 25 years to build when Britain was at the height of her naval power in the 19th century. We sailed past Portland Bill, which extends its club foot into the English Channel to obstruct its flow and create the notorious maelstrom of overfalls and violently breaking seas called the Portland Race, which we took care to avoid by staying well offshore. Our next port of call was Brixham, which in the Middle Ages was the largest fishing port in all of Britain and which gives its name to the Brixham trawler. Like many ports around the coast of Britain, the inner harbour dries out at low tide. We had now reached the west country county of Devon, where verdant hills, so typical of the English countryside, slope steeply down to the sea. Coastal towns are tucked away in craggy indentations, known in this part of the world as coombs. Solcum first appeared in the records in 1244 and has a bar, or shallow area, at the entrance to the inlet which can be dangerous in bad weather. The only hazard we faced was manoeuvring our way through flocks of sailing dinghies, battling it out in races associated with the local regatta. Ashore, the narrow streets, little changed over the centuries, were thronged with holiday makers and ill-suited for modern traffic. There are many wrecks off this rugged coast, including one dating from the Bronze Age. We continued west to Foy in the county of Cornwall. This part of the country has long been famous for the production of China clay. As recently as 2008, one million tons was exported annually from this tiny port to countries around the world, and relatively large freighters are a surprising sight in this picturesque harbor.
Our furthest point west was Falmouth, the last major town in Britain before the land runs out at Land's End. This location made it the natural point of departure and the first landfall for vessels returning from long voyages overseas. One of these was HMS Beagle, which called here in 1836 on her return from the Galapagos Islands, which we visited last year. As we turned our bows east to retrace our course in the direction of Southampton and the Isle of Wight, we passed a colourful fleet of local gaff rigged cutters. We visited the historic town of Plymouth to meet up with family and friends and enjoy traditional rides in the Barbican area, which dates from the 11th century. Within earshot of the carousel is the site of the Mayflower Steps. A nearby wall carries plaques commemorating the many historic voyages which left from this spot, chief among them being those which led to the formation of the United States of America. On the 6th of September 1620, the Pilgrim Fathers sailed from Plymouth in the Mayflower, in the providence of God, to settle in New Plymouth and to lay the foundation of the New England States. Other voyagers left here for destinations even further afield when the tiny country of Britain was busy colonizing the world. We set out from those same steps and sailed past generations of fortifications designed to deter centuries of foreign marauders. They could not of course stop bombs falling from the skies in the Second World War when Plymouth suffered 59 bombing raids which destroyed over 3,700 houses. Our final destination before returning to Southampton was the lovely little town of Dartmouth. This small port has been historically important for centuries. Dartmouth Castle, still prominent at the entrance to the harbour, was built in 1481. It was the point of departure for the Crusades in 1147 and 1190. And during the Hundred Years' War, some 600 years ago, a huge chain resting on barges was strung across the harbour mouth every night. 
In more recent conflicts, it was a base and training ground for American forces in the build-up to D-Day and the landings at Utah Beach in Normandy. Today, Dartmouth is a favorite holiday destination as well as being the home of famous Dartmouth Naval College, similar in function to Annapolis in the United States. Thousands of yachts crowd the harbour and ferries link the towns of Dartmouth on one shore to Kingswear with its colourful houses on the other. Moorings are in short supply in August, and by an amazing coincidence completely unplanned, we shared one with an Aleutian and the only other Fleming 65 currently in Europe. A steam train links Kingswheel with Paynton a short way along the coast. The locomotives, restored by steam enthusiasts, are fired by premium coal all the way from Russia. To those of us who recall the days of steam, the round trip was a nostalgic journey.
Many old buildings survive from the past. This coaching inn was built in 1671. A lotus rumbles past the Butterwalk, which dates from 1635. Charles II held court here in 1639. At high tide, the Dart River is navigable inland for several miles, and we took Ventures Tender upstream through lovely English countryside to the village of Dittisham, where we had lunch at the ferry boat inn. Back in Dartmouth, the evening sun highlighted Dartmouth College. It was regatta week and many special events had been laid on including a visit by a square rigger which must once have been a common sight. Unfortunately, bad weather cancelled the fly pass by aircraft from World War II. Ground swelled from the English Channel, even penetrated the protected harbour. As a timely reminder of the vital services they provide, rescue teams gave a demonstration of their skills. As we saw time and again on our trip, yachting is a very popular sport in this island nation, mostly in sailboats but it is not to be taken casually in these treacherous waters. The following day we headed directly for Southampton with the cardinal markers delineating the danger spots and on past the needles at the western tip of the Isle of Wight. Two months later this place experienced winds gusting to 100 miles an hour. Just a few days after our return, Venture 2 was on display at the Southampton International Boat Show. And just two weeks after that, we set sail for Hamburg, up the River Elbe. It was early on the morning of October the 12th when we departed the Itchen River in Southampton. We were bound for Hamburg with our first stop at Dover. Hovercraft run between the Isle of Wight and the town of Portsmouth with its distinctive Spinnaker Tower. The Palmerston forts guarding the Solent were built in 1859 in response to a perceived threat of invasion by the French. The channel was in a rare benign mood as we passed the line of cliffs known as the Seven Sisters and on to the famous landmark of Beachy Head. 
The name is actually a corruption of the French beau chef, meaning beautiful headland. For many years, this has been a notorious suicide spot. The lighthouse dates from 1902. We reached over at sunset and received a green light to enter the harbour. The first streaks of dawn were painting the sky as we got underway the following morning. The first ferry from France appeared out of the gloom. The English Channel is a virtual freeway of shipping which has to follow east-west separation zones. Vessels crossing the channel must do so at right angles. Here venture is shown in red with other traffic as triangles with red arrows denoting their course and speed. The dotted circles mark wreck sites. We were intercepted by a French customs launch and asked to slow down and answer a number of questions on the radio before being allowed to continue on our way. We passed numerous ships at anchor near the coast. We spent the next night at Scheveningen in Holland. We arrived after dark and tied up alongside a fishing boat, which fortunately was not leaving in the middle of the night. It remained calm the following morning, but the mackerel sky proved to be an accurate indication of what was to come. We again passed through a fleet of anchored ships, here represented on the radar by a group of triangles. The cluster of red blobs are an offshore wind farm situated some 15 miles off the Dutch coast. There are modern windmills everywhere in Europe and I counted 60 in just this cluster. We were then hailed by a Dutch Coast Guard boat which launched a rib which sped over the waves and came alongside to board us. They looked very businesslike and we were wondering what we had done to deserve their attention. The previous evening we had used an inshore route intended for small craft for which we qualified being less than 20 meters. It turned out that our AIS transmitter had been wrongly programmed and it was broadcasting our length at 25 meters. Our official papers confirmed our correct length to the boarding party, who then checked the vessel and went on their way with a friendly wave. wind rose to 30 knots during the night and it was coming directly at us which made for a very uncomfortable ride with short steep seas breaking every few seconds. Good morning, uh, 
Because of the previous misunderstanding, we were out in the offshore separation zone and we encountered convoys of big ships throughout the night. We worked double watches with three hours on and three hours off. It was a great relief to enter the protection of the Elba estuary. The wind was still strong, but the waves had diminished. Flocks of gulls wheeled in our wake, and we encountered all kinds of craft on this busy waterway. As we approached Hamburg, 60 miles upriver, the low-lying banks gave rise to wooded slopes and attractive houses. The tide was in our favor and we made good time. Finally, the city with all its commercial docks hove into sight. At this point, the Elbe separates into many channels. The harbour has 60 basins and 42 miles of quays, as well as slipways and floating dry docks. Scenic Lake Ulster lies at the heart of the city, which hums with activities of every variety. An extensive park, much of it below the level of adjacent streets, provides a restful haven from the surrounding bustle. Restaurants abound, including this beer house serving traditional food and beer brewed on the premises. Early every Sunday morning, the fish market attracts hundreds of people. The market offers far more than fish, including live music inside this original warehouse.
einzige Problem bei diesen Zwiebelwürfel ist jetzt, die sind absolut schön. Du sollst deine Ahnung doch selber in den Back gespielt so. Noch Wildlachsschnitzel dabei, noch Wildlachsrücken, noch Venture was the biggest powerboat in the show, and together with the biggest sailboat, we took part in a photo shoot for local press and TV. This earned us a picture in the local newspaper. The show lasted 10 days and was held in a small basin normally reserved for traditional craft. This vessel is about to leave on a four month trip to Cuba and Central America with a crew of young people. Crowds of friends and relatives have come to see them off. It was now our turn to start our journey to Dusseldorf. A barge load of Airbus parts was the first of many commercial vessels we encountered as we headed back down the Elbe. was now well advanced and the foliage along the banks was closed in the russet colors of autumn. Eleven miles downstream we passed Meeting Point where inbound and outbound ships are hailed from the shore in a moving ceremony which has been practiced for more than 50 years. Here the national anthem of the Port of Registry of the passing ship is played on loudspeakers and the appropriate national flag is raised and dipped. Details of where she has come from or where she is bound are announced and she is welcomed to Hamburg or bid farewell and wish the safe journey. We reached Cuxhaven at the mouth of the river just after dark. The marina was closed for the winter except for ourselves and a couple of sailboats homeward bound after the show. At noon the following day we headed out into the North Sea where strong winds were once again on the nose for the overnight passage. It was not yet daylight when we turned in between the Frisian Islands. The tortuous channel had to be navigated with great care following the flashing lights of the hundreds of red and green marks. 
The satellite view clearly shows the maze of sandbanks on the approach to the town of Harlingen. It was just after dawn when we entered the small harbour, which was so unmistakably Dutch that it could have been nowhere other than Holland. We tied up right in the centre of town. We had a schedule to keep and the following day we were underway at dawn. The ferry entering the harbour was from the Frisian island of Terschelling. We visited the fuel barge moored in the busy commercial harbour, which was tucked away without imposing its presence on the traditional town. This was our first visit to a fuel dock since leaving Dover. As the price was high and had to be paid for in cash, euros only, we took on just 250 US gallons enough to provide us with a safety margin to get us to Dusseldorf against the strong currents of the Rhine and the Eisel. We were now in the world of the barge. The ships on the Elbe were ocean going, but we were now entering the amazing network of Europe's inland waterways, which transport a huge amount of freight. Some of these barges are family affairs, providing both a home and a livelihood for their owners. Others run 24 hours a day with double crews, working two weeks on followed by one week off. The living quarters are at the stern, and although not in this case, usually carry a car or two. We headed south down a channel deep enough for venture just two hours either side of high tide. We passed through a lock into the huge freshwater lake called the Iselmeer. This had been part of the North Sea until it was divided off by a 20 mile long dike built in 1932. We shared the lock with a barge and had to watch out for the powerful wash from its twin rudders. There was not much change in level, as the lock serves to separate the tidal and salty North Sea from the non-tidal freshwater lake. The 
The Isselmere is 425 square miles in area and the low-lying land was barely visible on the horizon. We still had strong headwinds, but this time the spray was fresh water, which washed away the salt accumulated on the North Sea. Another group of windmills and this bridge marked the entrance to the Isel River, and from now on we would be following rivers and canals all the way to Düsseldorf. We stopped for the night in Kampen, another unmistakably Dutch town. Cheese is obviously very popular in this town. This plaque is a sinister reminder of the horrors that took place in this and other towns in the not-so-distant past. The following morning we passed under a lift bridge which had been raised for us and headed up the Isle against the three-knot current. Our route took us through Holland and Germany, up the Isel, and then the Neder Rhine, through the Panisden Canal to the mighty Rhine itself. Huge flocks of cormorants exploded from the water ahead of us. Fishermen, every few yards along the banks, meant we had to keep our speed slow so that our wake did not wash them and their gear into the water. This meant that with a three-knot current against us, we could only make about six knots over the ground. Skeins of Canada geese were getting ready to fly south for the winter.
This is the town of Deventa, where the bridge scenes for the film The Bridge Too Far was shot. There were a total of four lift bridges along this section of the river. This one is at the town of Zertfen, where more scenes were filmed. At regular intervals, small ferries provided the means for local traffic to cross the river. We stopped at a small marina in Duisburg and woke up in the morning to find fog which was too thick for us to safely navigate the river. It finally began to lift around one o'clock when we got underway. Even so, we had to proceed cautiously as barges materialized ghost-like out of the mist. Here we reached the end of the Eisel and turned for a short distance up the Nether Rhine to the town of Arnhem where we were to pick up our mandatory Rhine pilot the next day. We passed under the very bridge which was the scene of bitter fighting in September 1944 and which was the bridge too far in the film of the same name. Right. 
The marina was full, but we found a spot to tie up next to some houseboats, alongside walls generously decorated with graffiti. The following morning we picked up our Rhine pilot who came aboard with his personal portable wheels and we retraced our steps down the Nidder Rhine to the junction with the Eisel and then took the short Panasden Canal to its junction with the Rhine River. The barge traffic increased enormously as soon as we reached this major artery. A few miles upstream we crossed the border from Holland into Germany and had to stop at Emmerich to get our permit to navigate on the Rhine. We tied up alongside a government dock while an official took details of the boat and issued our permit. This is a nuclear power plant which was never commissioned and turned instead into a playground. Along some stretches, barges navigate within a few feet of the banks. We spent one night in a small marina at Vessel. A few barges like this one are double length. The 816 number on the bank is a kilometre marker. There are markers every one tenth of a kilometre. Work goes on while the barges are underway. This bridge is a casualty of World War II. it can be a long walk from one end of a barge to the other. Duisburg the river becomes very industrial.
current was now even stronger, running at three and a half knots against us. One barge even had our name. We passed the ramp for the exhibition hall for the Dusseldorf show where Venture was to be lifted out in four weeks. We had arrived at Dusseldorf, a city built at a great loop in the river, requiring tight turns by the heavily loaded barges. The blue panel at the pilot house indicates she wants to pass starboard side to starboard side. This barge has deck cargo of two cars, a motorcycle and a boat. We had reached our destination, a small marina overlooked by quirky architecture and in the shadow of the prominent TV transmission tower. We stirred up some mud as Venture was eased into her tight berth, but she was secure and remained here until December the 15th when she was lifted out for her next show. In the meantime, the Rhine just keeps rolling along, as she has for centuries. <laughs>